Today on CityCast DC, it's day two of the DC Love Kit, our week of episodes dedicated to finding and nurturing love, all kinds of love, in the district. We're a week out from Valentine's Day, but let's be real. In DC, dating is a hot topic year round. So we're here with dating coach Erica Etten to break down all your questions about romance in the district. From the stress about dating across the river to making sure your dates don't feel like job interviews. It's Tuesday, February 7th. I'm lead producer Priyanka Tilve. And I'm Hey DC newsletter editor Kayla Cody Stemmerman. And this is CityCast DC. Erica Etten from A Little Nudge. We are so excited to have you on the podcast today. Um, Kayla is our newsletter writer. I am the lead producer of the show. And we are both single. Uh, so. <laughs> so fun. So fun. Actually, I guess that's that brings me right to my first question. Oh, right. I don't know okay, if, coming in hot. Yeah, I don't know if fun is the word I would use. When you think of D.C. dating, like D.C. in particular, what are the first words that come to mind for you? What do you do? Oh my God. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, if, yeah. If I could make it through a date without that question coming up, it's like instant success. I mean, that is a normal question though. Like I feel weird. Yeah. Cause I want to ask that question. Cause I really do want to know what somebody does, but I don't want to be like that person that asks that on a first date, you know? I mean, what else are people asking though? I mean, if you spend at least 40 hours a week doing a thing, it makes sense that somebody would want to know, but you know, stereotypically, DC yeah. <laughs> career, blah, blah. You know, it's interesting because fill in the blank with city. Everyone says to me, oh, dating in DC is the worst. Dating in New York is this. Dating in LA is this. And to be honest, in all the years doing what I've been doing, coaching and helping people with online dating, I do find that most major cities are the same in terms <laughs> of dating. There are nuances like LA, you have to drive everywhere, you know, Things like that, like in D.C., people don't want to go from D.C. to Arlington sometimes. So there are nuances. But in general, dating in major cities is very similar. Are there any unique benefits or challenges of dating in D.C. in particular that you've seen? Well, like I just said, with the geography, I think some people are very in their bubble about where they live. I'm not venturing out of this bubble. I used to have a friend who lived at 14th and V. And she was like, I'm not going below U Street. And I'm like, you realize that's one block. So I think sometimes people get very set in their location and won't think about, huh, there might be somebody amazing, a metro ride, or God God forbid, having to change metro lines. I do think that is a particular, I don't know if it's an issue, but it's a thing, it's a topic that comes up in DC. I've seen it with people, you know, oh, mm, I don't want to go there for a date. So That is a uniquely D.C. thing. Another challenge in D.C. is very transient. And so sometimes people are coming for a one or two year job or some sort of program or grad school, and they're not necessarily staying beyond that point. And so that just does make it more difficult. I would say good things about D.C. are, despite what I said about location, I do think it's pretty easy to get around whether you have a car or not. There is the metro, there's Uber. So it is pretty easy to get around. There are a lot of interesting places. I mean, I remember when I first moved, you didn't go east of 14th Street. And everyone lived in Northwest, right? And now, Mm, yeah, I mean, it was a different time. Now, there are so many little enclaves or places to discover. You can really be creative about date locations because there's always something new popping up. Just pick a new neighborhood and try a place and it can be really fun. And so I think that is definitely a positive. Also, look, a lot of people in DC are really well educated. That doesn't hurt. You know, a lot of people are coming for school or going to grad school or working in government or a, a big company that does something international. Yeah, it's not the worst idea to surround yourself with (laughs) indulgent people, I guess. Absolutely. (laughs) So I would say those are the highlights. Great. Thank you so much. I think I want to go back to something that you touched on first, which is dating across the river. And, you know, when I was sort of floating this idea of this podcast around, everybody's first question is absolutely like, oh, 
what do you do about dating across the river? Like, is it worth it? I know of a lot of friends, myself, honestly, I am guilty of this, where somebody has to really, really meet some high standards for me to cross the river to go on a first date with them. What do you say to that? Is that reasonable? Is that ridiculous? What should people be doing here? First of all, I have many (laughs) thoughts about this. I do think it's ridiculous and it is relevant, but I don't know what your standards or your criteria are. But let's say you have some, which everybody should. If you're already narrowing the pool quite a bit, why do you want to narrow it by just a few miles? Because there could be somebody in Arlington or in wherever Falls Church who might be amazing. And remember, homes are not (laughs) set in stone, but like people move, (laughs) you know, you meet the right person, who knows one day, right? We're not talking long distance. We're not talking across the country, across (laughs) the pond. We're talking across a river that a metro goes on. What I think is really funny about the dating across the river things that people that live in Northwest will date people that live in Northeast, which can require transferring metro lines or can... Which takes longer. Mm-hmm. Even farther. Yeah. Yeah. And There's DC no traffic, metro. <sighs> right. Exactly. At least if you're going against traffic in rush hour, it's pretty quick. Now, I will say, Kayla, I don't know if you're dating men, women, whatever, but you said, I'm not going across the river for a first date. However... I want people coming a little closer to you for a first date to perhaps show some chivalry. If somebody does ask you on a date, I consider that them wanting to be, and I don't know if this is always the case, maybe you're asking, and that's great too, but generally the asker should be the one who makes it a little more convenient for the other person. Hmm. And so if someone Mm -hmm. lives in, say, Clarendon, and you live in, I don't know, DuPont Circle, I would want them to at least come into D.C. Interesting. I never thought about it that way. Mm-hmm. They ask. I think it says a lot about someone if they ask you on a date and then just say, let's meet here. And that place is not convenient for you. I find that to be really selfish. And it's yeah, usually near rude. their apartment, which means easy it's access. Lazy. It's lazy. It's lazy, people. It's lazy. <laughs> and then you have to wonder, like, what are they looking for that they planned it so close to their apartment? A little effort goes a long way, especially for a first date when you should be trying to make a great first impression. Totally. One thing that we found in our reporting about this is that of all of the states and cities in the country, D.C. is always near the top of the list of cities that have the most people actively looking to date. Like we are a city of singles. Uh Do you think of that as a good thing or does it just kind of increase the likelihood that you're going to get trapped in the paradox of choice? I would say a little of each. So I'm sure people know, but for anyone who doesn't know, the paradox of choice that was coined by someone named Barry Schwartz. And it's when you have so many options that you're not actually, one, it's hard to choose. And two, you're never satisfied with what you do choose. No one's happy with their choice at the Cheesecake Factory because there are too many options. Except the Bang Bang Chicken and Shrimp, which is always the best option. But you're happy when there's like four items and you pick the best one. Yay. And so... I do think the paradox of choice makes dating harder. However, if someone is really intent on finding a partner, that's not going to get in their way. What's hard because there's no shortcut to figuring out what people are looking for. You could ask, what are you looking for? But that's an answer in a vacuum that has no context, right? You learn over time. And the people who want to find a relationship are not going to be swayed by all of the options out there. So one of the other things we found is that there's actually significantly more women in D.C. that are single than men, specifically like college educated women. What does that balance mean, though? Like women have, you know, assuming you're dating men have less choice. Are men paralyzed? There's so many options. (laughs) What does that manifest as? Stop worrying about your competition, the number of people, because it really doesn't matter. There's always going to be ample people. So it really does not matter what the ratio is. It does not matter in absolute numbers how many people there are, because there are always going to be people out there who are interesting, right? And so, yes, there are a lot of amazing, educated women in D.C. There are also a lot of amazing, educated men. There are also a lot of amazing, uneducated people. So it really doesn't matter. And so I wouldn't worry too much about these ratios, because unfortunately, a lot of times, 
people use these statistics or generalizations to rationalize them not putting themselves out there. So like, oh, there's too many women, you know, not enough men. So hmm, it's not worth it. Or like, oh, everyone leaves DC. So I'm not going to put myself out there. And I can't encourage people strongly enough to just stop that. Like, it's just an excuse. Yeah. Well, okay. So going back to the very first thing you said, the fact that this is a bit of a job obsessed market, I think it's fair to say. I agree with you that like, what do you do is a question that's going to come up in a conversation. Yeah, wherever you are. But I think that what's unique about DC is one, there's like this perception that your answer to that question is going to like put you in a box in a way that maybe it doesn't happen in other cities. Mm -hmm. And two, the conversation can very easily get totally sidetracked by that question. And you end up spending your entire day talking about your jobs or politics. Do you have any suggestions for how to avoid falling into that trap? Yeah, don't. Change the topic. (laughs) It's not an interview. You can say, I was at work all day. Do you mind if we talk about something else? You can do that without making it a thing. You know, it's funny. I actually did that once and the guy did not take it well. Well, Uh, that's that's a him problem, not a you problem. Yeah, that's true. That's fair. You know, especially if you're like frustrated about work that day, the last thing you want to do is talk about work on your date. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can very politely change the topic you can make a joke like i just said i don't know why that would have offended him who knows it's a mystery i would rather you leave the date having learned nothing about the other person but knowing that you laughed the whole time or had a good time or felt good about yourself than learn all of this factual information about somebody Mm -hmm. i read a date lab one where the couple that went on a date they fell out over an opinions difference about Andrew Yang and they just could not reconcile it and they never went out again I don't know why they invited Andrew Yang on their date but it's like that's the most DC thing I've ever heard I know isn't that awful I've ever heard I mean in my opinion it's ridiculous even though I live in DC I'm not terribly political I guess some people that's very important to them I mean, another topic I hear people talk about a lot in the city along that vein is like if you see someone on a dating app or end up going on a date with someone who is from a different political party or works for a company that you disagree with or have objections to, is it fair to rule people out based on that? And when you're on a date, how early on do you discuss those differences or do you just never get to it because you're focusing on what you might have in common instead? I would say it really depends on how important politics are to you. If it's not something important in your day to day, I don't Mm -hmm. know why you would bring it up so early. But is it wrong to exclude someone because they have a different belief? I can't answer that question. It's right for some people and wrong for other people. I will say not everyone who lists moderate means conservative. I know a lot of people are like, oh, he listed moderate. That must mean he loves Trump. No, Mm -hmm. maybe not. Maybe he just wanted something that was more middle of the road and moderate is the only option. Mm. Or if someone does say conservative, that also doesn't necessarily mean they're all Trumpy. You know what I mean? And so like asking questions never hurts. I would have said before Mm. 2016, never bring up politics on a first date. Now it's inevitable because of what Trump has done, I think, to society. He's really segregated society. Especially in D.C. Especially in D.C. Exactly. And so... I think if it's important to someone, it's going to come up regardless of whether you ask or not. If something's important to you, you're very involved in democratic politics, you're going to talk about it because it's something that's important to you. Yeah, that's fair. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Deal breakers, red flags. These are all things that I've been asked on first dates. And it does. It really puts you on the spot. It really puts or past relationships. None Mm. of that. I hate when people ask about my hobbies and I'm like, okay, having a full-time job and going on dates isn't enough now. Like, that one I'll disagree with. I don't like the word hobby because I think it does put undue pressure on people. Absolutely. But all they're really asking is what do you like to do after work? So like I never ask clients what their hobbies are. I just ask, hey, what do you like to do on a random Tuesday night? Or mm-hmm. what would you be doing right now if you're not out, if you weren't out with me? Mm-hmm. So yeah. just think of the hobby question as, all they really want to know is what you do when you're not working. Mm. So that one doesn't. Noted. I'm sorry to disagree. But <laughs> that's okay. No, that's no, why we're here. That one doesn't bother me. 
Switching gears a little bit, I think, you know, DC is very centered around like happy hours, Mm -hmm. like speakeasies, bars, like Mm -hmm. cocktails, which is all fun, all great. Mm -hmm. What about somebody who like doesn't want to or can't drink? What do you do for a first date? How do you get like the mood going? Like, Mm -hmm. what's your advice? So if it if it were warmer out, I would say you take a walk. You, mm. But it's winter and <laughs> walks are hard. So I also find coffee dates to be fairly unromantic. That's not mm. to say you shouldn't do it's a stiff. coffee date. Yeah. It is a little stiff. So it, it, it does get hard in the winter. There are activities, though I don't necessarily recommend some big activity for a first date because you want to get to know each other. But maybe you go to a place like boardroom where you can mm, play board, board games. I do too. Or somewhere you can play darts or something where you're still getting to know each other, but at least there's something to distract you that's not alcohol. You can go to the botanical gardens, which is open year round and it's mostly indoors. Yeah, it's a place to take place. a walk that's artificially warmer. Sound um, like dream dates, honestly. Oh, well, yeah, perfect. Understand. And I'll put well on the head. <laughs> <laughs> I know people make fun of this, but I really do like museum dates. I think um, it's so cute. Yeah, and I think like depending on the museum you pick, like the Hirschhorn, the Hirschhorn is provocative, right? It's modern art. There's a lot of stuff that's thought provoking. And when you're walking around talking about that with someone, it spurs a lot of side conversations sure. and you learn a lot about yeah. your date. Yeah, and you play fun games like coming up with the new titles for each art exhibit. <laughs> right, because they're all untitled anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, we're like creating backstories. Like, what was they thinking when they made this piece? Mm-hmm. I will say I recently went on a date to the museum, the Mansion on O Street, which I don't know if oh. you've been, but it's kind of like a, a giant hoarding house. <laughs> yeah. It was the weirdest date I've ever been at. I do not know if I recommend that one specifically. It was like hidden doors. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Different. At least you'll remember it. It's different. Very true. If you do drink alcohol, then I generally do just recommend a drink for a first date. You don't have to be overly creative. I would find some, like when I'm scheduling dates for clients, if I haven't been to a venue, I'll just look at pictures on Yelp and mm. see how ample the bar seating is. And actually, also on first dates, if you are going out for a drink or a coffee or whatever, it's always nice to sit next to each other versus across. I generally recommend oh. sitting at a bar or if you have to sit at a table and you can sit catty corner instead of across. It's easier to have a conversation because, you know, like sometimes those two top tables are so long that you're like, hey, over there, <laughs> you know, you're probably not going to yes. share anything personal if you have to share it with the entire place. So right. I usually recommend grabbing two seats at the bar. That way you don't have to stare into each other's eyes the whole time. If your elbows accidentally graze each other, oh well. (laughs) And then there's distractions too, like watching the bartender make drinks and other Mm. people. And it just doesn't feel like so much pressure. Yeah, this is brilliant. Um, A lot of the conversation out there around dating in D.C. is really heteronormative. Mm -hmm. So we were just curious if you know about how the queer dating scene here might be a little bit different or tips that you have specifically for queer people in D.C. I think dating apps have really revolutionized dating for anyone who identifies as queer because before there was no central location to go. And now you can go online and it's just made life a lot easier. Most of the mainstream sites, Bumble, Hinge all offer options for anyone seeking anyone. And then there are also different options for people who are, say, polyamorous or in some kind of ethically non-monogamous situation, which keeps popping up on the dating apps, by the way. You know, I work with people of all orientations, all genders, and I don't give any different advice. So mm. all the same advice, and I would definitely make sure you're on at least one dating app because that is now mm. the number one way to meet among uh, the queer community. Cool. Well, Erica, thank you so much for being here today. You answered so many of our burning DC oh, questions. Boy, I, hope, I hope I put out the fire a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, we're excited to have you on again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And before you go, here's some quick news. A D.C. bill introduced last week would incentivize people to switch from gas to electric stoves. The bill would encourage households making less than $80,000 a year to replace their gas stoves and heating appliances entirely for free. 
Environmentalists argue that gas stoves are a menace to the planet and also contribute to bad indoor air quality. Meanwhile, Coachella is suing DC's Mochella event for trademark infringement. They argue that the name Mochella is just a little too similar to the famous music festival and that it's damaging their brand after a DC teen was shot and killed at the event last summer. Mochella organizers, however, have been adamant about keeping the name. Also, the lower section of Malcolm X Park is finally open again. After two years of construction, it's now handicapped accessible and looking better than ever. The fountain still isn't running, but the National Park Service says they hope to get it going by spring. Oh, and one last thing. CityCast DC is hiring. Do you or someone you know have experience in sales and revenue? Are you deeply connected to the community here in DC? We're looking for a senior account executive to join our team as soon as possible to work on selling sponsorships for our podcast and newsletter. Check the show notes for this episode to find a full job description. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, tell somebody who's been scared to jump into the DC dating pool. It could always use a few more fish. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Nothing like a cough attack in the middle of tracking, huh?